The English will have their own neoclassical forms when it comes to furniture. Uh, a lot of what they're going to do is going to incorporate the use of carved relief. Now, we're not going to see the amount of gilding uh, and the use of really elaborate tapestry upholstery that we saw from the French. The English tend to be a little bit simpler, but they are attracted by the clean lines that we see from the French styles. We will also see the use of classical columns specifically as uprights, as decorative elements, for example, on the corner of a case or as legs on a desk. So we're going to start with Adam style furniture and Adam style furniture is very similar to what we've seen in the English Rococo. The difference is they're going to clean it up a little bit rather than these three-dimensional forms that we tend to see decorating Rococo pieces. He's going to paint on the decorations, although here's our husk decoration, for example, uh, being repeated here. But he's going to use a lot of mechanical circles, so we're going to see a lot of tables that are oval, circle, or in this case, semicircle, and oftentimes painted in some way. Sometimes he's doing this with uh, marquetry, giving us this very light form of the, in this case, parlor table. Now, Heppel White is going to be another great furniture maker known primarily for his chairs. And he has a number of different backs that he will put on these chairs, some of them more uh, decorative than others. For example, the shield back is very common, the heart-shaped back. Uh, here's another shield back, and here's a uh, Prince of Wales feathers in an oval back, it's a very complicated piece. But when we look at his pieces, uh, they're all going to incorporate a spade foot, or commonly incorporate a spade foot, which is basically a squared off piece that's going to taper to almost a point. Very similar to what we saw from the French neoclassical, but instead of being turned, it's actually hand carved or cut. Now, when we look at common features of Heppel White style furniture, we tend to see a graceful, delicate appearance, very simple geometry. Uh, if you see something that's curved, it's going to be a subtle curve or it's going to be a mechanical curve, a part of a circle. We're going to see short chests of drawers, pieces that are a little bit understated, straight legs, often fluted or reeded, fluted, cut in, reeded, means that those uh, vertical pieces come out towards the viewer. And we're going to see some motifs like swags, ribbons, feathers, urns, and trees, but they'll usually be on the fixtures or in the marquetry work. We also have Sheridan furniture. Now, Sheridan, Thomas Sheridan, uh, will write a book called The Cabinet Maker and Upholsterer's Drawing Book. And he's going to be very influential with this text where he's designing things, but he isn't necessarily making them. Uh, and this is another element of specialization and professionalization that we see in the world of interior design. Now, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, with the chairs, chair backs tend to be rectilinear. Sometimes there are going to be porcelain plaques inset. We're going to see small scale decorations, veneers and inlays. And he's going to use the same types of furniture legs as we saw from Heppelwhite, although the back legs continue upward to form the back of the support. So the difference is here, the back leg would come up and this would be one solid piece going back to that rear leg. Now he also designs the Carlton House desk, which was similar to a French bureau a jardin, gradin. And the writing table itself had three side-by-side -side drawers underneath the top, but the uniqueness was the added U-shape unit on top of the piece. Although there's no uh, pigeonholes typically, sometimes there are, but typically there are not, we do see small sloping tops surmounting the drawers at either end. And what we have is this very graceful neoclassical curve moving around the back, combined with that same classical curve down to that drawer. It's a very graceful piece, and it's put up again on these very narrow feet that are fluted, and that is going to give it a certain sense of grace. This is very 
antithetical to the monumental style we see from desks in the Empire period in France. We'll also see the breakfront bookshelf. And the breakfront was a bookshelf where the center section projects slightly beyond the front of the piece. Uh, oftentimes we will see some kind of pediment on top of the piece. Oftentimes they're going to be broken uh, or lost. So oftentimes there will be some kind of uh, fancy piece up here, frequently triangular. Believe it or not, that's my attempt at triangular right now. Uh, so there would frequently be a pediment there. The break front just breaks up the line of what would otherwise be a very dull case. And in many cases, you would have a pull-out desk, uh, which would allow you to work while displaying uh, your text. Basically, you're still showing off. But in this case, because England has become more and more educated, they want to show off, instead of showing off dishware and that sort of thing, they're showing off their books with the understanding that they have read and understood the books that are there. Hence the glazed front and the importance and size of many of these break front bookcases. Here we do see uh, some of that marquetry work and the use of the woods. Now, if this were, for example, Rococo, we would expect some metal decorative details in relief. We would expect some impressive carving, but we're not seeing that here. Instead, we have some very simple uh, pediments being used as decorative elements. We have a very simple bracket foot on it. And the top, uh, sorry, pilaster uh, uprights, and the top would have been our very simple pediment or triangular form on top of the shelf, although again, those are frequently lost because they're usually independent to the piece. In real life, these frequently break at this point uh, so that they can actually be moved and transported without giving yourself a hernia. So I want to look at some of those features of our Sheridan furniture. We're going to see strong, well-proportioned geometric shapes. We're going to see contrasting veneers and inlays, uh, the use of light, elegant, delicate forms, and a lot of secret drawers and sliding mechanisms, very similar to the Harlequin furniture that we saw from Louis XVI. Also, straight legs and simple feet. This is meant to be a very pragmatic piece where the beauty comes from the elegance and curvilinear form rather than coming from a giant behemoth of a piece that we might have seen from the Baroque with all of its decorative carving and relief and everything else. These tend to be simpler, but they're looking for that cleaner appearance. This is, again, the neoclassical is a reaction against the ostentatious over-decoration of the Baroque and the Rococo.